a shout of Je unto Jesus right now. Hallelujah.
stand up on your feet, say It's you
someone where you are. No one else ever like you do. Sing, no one else can confess to you. No one can, no one can love me like you. Come on, where you are, just declare, say, no one else go. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. There's no one like you, God. No one compares to you, Father. Your greatness is unmatched, oh Lord. Your splendor is beyond description. Oh, when we think about your greatness, nothing comes close, oh Father. You're the beginning and the end. The first, the last, the one that won't pass, oh King of Kings. We worship you and exalt you, Father. For there is no one, in, no one, no one is like you, Father. No one compares to you, Lord. Yeah. Mavuno family, it is so amazing and it is such an honor to be with you bringing God's word this morning. My name is Pastor Michael Obo Onen, aka Pastor Mike, and I have the privilege and the honor of leading at Mavuno churches right here in Uganda. And it's so amazing and so such an honor to be called your pastor. For our visitors, we're so glad that you are here at the home of the fearless, where our mission is simply to turn ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. And that's taken from the book of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that asks us to go out into the world and make disciples, baptizing them, but also teaching them to obey God's word. And that's what we are about right here. So once again, I just want to say, you are absolutely welcome to the home of the fearless. Through the month of February, we have been going through an amazing sermon series titled Relation Slips, How to Avoid Sabotaging Your Relationships. And over the past two weeks, we um, went through having the conversation about the five common mistakes that people make when they're looking for a marriage partner. Yes, there are mistakes that people make when they're looking for a marriage partner. I don't know whether you remember the mistakes that we talked about. We talked about five mistakes. We talked about trusting your feelings, majoring on the minors. We talked about failing to consult wise mentors, but also date, um, date number four, dating in isolation and ignoring good friends. Now, if you missed any of these um, 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 sermons, you can actually go and catch up on these um, sermons on our YouTube channel at Mavuno Kampala, and then you'll be able to hear some of the things that we discussed, even though we talked about the five common mistakes that people make when they're looking for a marriage partner. So the question is, why do we then make these common mistakes? Why is it that even after hearing these messages, many people still go ahead and make these mistakes in their relationships, whether they're married or they're single? And I believe the key reason is because we enter into marriage for all the wrong reasons. We don't understand the purpose of marriage. We, we don't understand why we're getting into that institution. And so as we do that, then we keep on making this mistake. So today, we wanna have a simple conversation about what are the five wrong reasons why people get into marriage today. And so the, the sermon of my title is straightforward. It's just the same. It's five terrible reasons why people get married. But we're not going to end there. We're also going to talk about three really good reasons why people should get married. Are you guys ready? So terrible reason number one is because everyone is doing it. Now, the social pressure to get married heats up as we grow older. Now, I remember when you're leaving college and then you know that one colleague decides to go and get married. You're like, wow, it's so amazing. It's so beautiful. They're getting married so young. I know it's like, it's such a milestone, you know, that they're getting married at that particular age. And like, you know what, maybe when I get older, I'm going to do this. And then as time goes on, you attend one wedding to another wedding, 
one engagement party to another engagement party, one quandula to another quandula, and then you begin to wonder what's happening. It almost seems like everybody in my circles, everybody around me seems to be getting married. And so the pressure begins to build up even in your own life. And so by the time you're hitting your late, uh, your late 20s, you're maybe you're, you're, you're early or your mid uh, 30s, maybe about 35, and then all your friends are on social media, they're posting about their weddings, they're posting about, you know, the, 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 the baby showers they're going to, maybe they're posting pics, you know, first day in school for their kids, which nursery school that they're going to, and so the pressure does begin to mount up in your life, and you're like, there must be something that's wrong with me. And for real, let me tell you, social media can make you feel like everyone in the world is married except you. It almost makes you feel like you're the only person in the world who is not married. I don't know if I'm talking to someone here, but I mean, that's how it is. So, but here's the thing that you always have to keep in mind. Social media news only shows you what the people want to see. Social media only shows you what the people want to hear, what's trending. It's, it's just because of the search engines and the algorithm, and that's, that's what is being projected out there. And so you get confused and have this perception that everyone around you actually is married. Because you see, nobody's ever going to post an announcement on social media saying, um, I'm not engaged or I'm single and I'm happy. No, let me tell you. In fact, I heard the other day somebody, somebody wrote a book about enjoying their singlehood and the person was put on blast. Nobody wants to project that. People are more concerned about putting pictures of just engagement and all these kind of things that are happening. But you know, it's no wonder. Have you ever thought about it that sometimes people think that, they, that there are more plane crashes than actually planes that are landing? Because you, you, you remember back to that headline where, where they're saying, plane crashes, this and this number of people, you know, died on impact and everything like that. But nobody's telling you about the number of planes that are safely landing and the number of people that have traveled from continent to continent, from country to country. Nobody talks about that. Most people are concerned about the news and the headlines about what does not seem to be working. And so the fact is that there are actually many, many people out there who are actually still single more than you think. So it's important, please don't get married just because you think that everyone is doing it. But the terrible reason, uh, or number two, the, the second reason that's terrible why people get married is because they want to stop family pressure. Let me tell you, long before social media was ever conceived, long before there was the, you know, the, the worldwide net, let me tell you, there was something called family pressure that drove people to get married. And it's something that couldn't be ignored. You know, it's one of those things that people dread, that single people dread. By the time you're thinking about that family meeting, that wedding, uh, that wedding celebration that you're going to, that baby dedication that you're going to, and you're going to have to meet up with your family, your friends, your parents. And you know, even as you go into that place, people are looking at you. They're looking at your fingers. If you're a lady, they're looking at your fingers. Maybe, is it some, maybe the status may have changed. Maybe somebody may have put a ring on it. You know, something has happened. Or maybe, as, you know, they're, they're looking at your waistline to see maybe has something happened. And maybe is there something growing inside there? Has the status changed from just being a single person to being an expectant mother? There's all this pressure that is out there. Let me tell you, in some families, they don't, they don't even want to know sometimes whether you're married or not. They just want to know, is, is something happening? Maybe if they see that you're pregnant, maybe there's some sort of, of engagement or commitment that's going on. And people are put into all sorts of, of, of messy situations because of family pressure. You go to those places and they are constantly looking for telltale signs to see whether your relationship status is even changing. And many times you'll be in the space where there's somebody who's bold enough that will even come and ask you and say, so uh, my dear, so is there, is there somebody special in your life at this time? Or, you know, when, when are you going to bring someone home? When are we going to meet this person other than your friends and your cousins? When is this special person coming? Or, you know, they might even start to insinuate and say, you know that you're not getting any younger, we're not getting any younger, I want to, I want to see my grandchildren or my nieces before I, I die and things like that. And people begin to mount pressure on you. And woe unto you if your younger brother or your younger sister ends up getting married before you. They'll be like, ah, so you have not even been overtaken. What, what's the story about? Why are you delaying? And so there's so much pressure that's out there. And so, so many single people have been driven to the place of stress and panic because of all this family pressure that's being mounted on their 
every day and everywhere they go. And so you get the place where you begin to feel like, perhaps, maybe, is, is there something wrong with me? You know, am I not attracting the right people? Is there something wrong in my life? And so people get that place where there's so much pressure that's mounted up that you even begin to think less of yourselves even in that space. But that in itself is not a good reason why one should get married. But even just on the side, my advice, even as you think about some of these things, is that even as you enter into those spaces where the family is there, you need to, you need to pre-prepare for some responses that you, you, you need to give in advance. So, you, know, you need to think through them so that when you get into that space, you actually are able to confront, or actually able to have conversations. Because the reason why the pressure gets so much for some people is because they're not willing to actually confront those voices that come. You know, I, have you ever been in the space where somebody asks you a question and you act like maybe you didn't hear that question? You said, so I, I beg your pardon, what do you say? Or even just being blunt and straightforward and saying, well, um, I'm not really sure I want to talk about that. Um, this is the space and the season where I'm in right now. And so you're able to actually deal with some of this pressure um, that's going on in your life. Now, like I said, because of family pressure, that is absolutely a terrible reason why you should get married. So, terrible reason number three is because you want to have a beautiful wedding. Oh my God, let me tell you, in this country of ours, people spend millions, tens, hundreds of millions of shillings because of weddings, because you want to have that dream wedding, that beautiful wedding that you've, you've dreamt about. And let me tell you, the TV and the media does not even make it that much easier. When you go to some of these shows, the wedding show, and they're discussing the fabric of the bridesmaids, the fabric of the dress, that was made, how much it cost, how much, you know, things were put on it, how much is the shoe, how is it shiny, where was it made from, is it Italian, is it French, is it Turkish, and there's all this pressure out there, so somebody's like, man, my wedding must be that wedding, it's going to have to be put on blast on TV, it cannot just pass. And so because you just want to have that TV wedding, that beautiful wedding, all this pressure is on you, and for many people, that's the reason why they get married. And so many people take a lot more time and money actually preparing for that wedding day, that dream wedding, rather than actually preparing for the institution of marriage. Now there's nothing wrong with having a beautiful and you know a very elaborate wedding. I mean why not? If not, if you can afford it and your parents and your friends are willing to throw that for you, I mean that's absolutely good. But you have to understand that marriage is absolutely more than just that wedding day that you're going to experience. It's actually the rest of your life, every day, you know, dealing with this person, loving this person, forgiving this person, just continually sacrificing for this person, serving them even when you don't feel like it. That's what marriage is about. It's serious business and so it cannot, it cannot, it cannot be equated to just one single day of your life. I mean, think about it, your marriage is going to outlast your career, is going to outlast even you having kids at home. And think about it, your, for you to get to the place of your career, people spend a lot of money, spend years preparing. But how many years, how much time do people actually spend getting ready actually for the institution of, the mar of marriage? And that's why we, we actually just encourage our couples to, you know, to invest time in actually growing their marriages, do things together. In fact, right now, even as I speak, um, there's already a season of the Endora experience going on where there are couples who are actually working. There are some who are enriching their marriage. They're already in the space of marriage, but we also have those who we call the questers who are on, on this journey questing to get married. And so they're actually investing in working out their relationships because that's actually more important than just that one day, that beautiful wedding that you have to have. So getting married to have a beautiful wedding is a terrible reason to get married. But terrible reason number four to get married is to fix yourself. Now let me tell you, I, I, I remember I'm mentioning this to a, to, a, to a young lady around me and she was so offended when I said that. I said, you know what, uh, even before you get married, why don't you just fix yourself? I say, what do you mean? What do you, are, you saying I'm, are you saying I'm broken? Are you saying I'm baggage? But you see, the reason is that we are all human beings and we are all broken in one way or another. We all have things that we're dealing with. And sometimes rather than actually spending time as a singular person to deal with the issues that we have, we think that when we actually get married, that that's going to fix the situation. It's going to fix 
that person. And so that's why some people get married, because they believe that as soon as they get married, they are no longer going to be lonely. As soon as they get married, they are no longer going to be depressed. Or maybe they are, as soon as they get married, they're not going to be, there's not going to be that social awkwardness uh, because, you know, right now I, I'm married. And so it, it's almost like that takes everything away. As soon as I get married, I'm not going to be broke anymore. As soon as I get married, I'm not going to be unhappy. Or maybe they feel like maybe some of the addictions or even the toxic relationships that they're in, you know, like, you know, I, I can't deal with my family. I just want to get married and run away from this. Or, you know, I have these addictions. You know, I know that as soon as I get married, and I'm going to stop those addictions. And they feel like some of those unhealthy uh, behaviors or even unhealthy relationships are just going to go away as soon as you find the right person. And they believe that things will just eventually just work themselves out as soon as they get married. But this is far from the truth. Now, here's an excerpt from, from the book written by our, our, our senior pastor, Pastor Mede Wanjiao, and this is what it says. It says, a relationship only compounds the state it found you in. If you are lonely, you will marry another lonely person. And if each of you demand that the other person provide companionship that they are incapable of giving, I mean, that's why they got married in the first place. If you are broken, you'll marry another broken person and each of you will demand that the other heal them first. Unhealthy people attract un other unhealthy people with complementary dysfunctions. For example, people with addictions tend to be attracted to people who are codependent. That is, they're, they're saviors, people who have a need to be needed. And the worst thing is that your spouse will not be able to heal you, but they may actually oppose your healing when it starts to happen because you remaining as you are is what they need. They need you to remain broken so that you, you, can, you can need them. It says two very dependent people, each working hard to ensure that their partner will never become healed because then their need might not be met. Being married will not eliminate those feelings of being in a toxic, and, and let me tell you, it will not eliminate those feelings. And being in a space of a toxic marriage or a toxic relationship is much worse than where you are maybe in your feeling of, of pain and, and discouragement and depression all by yourself. You cannot compare being in a toxic marriage or a toxic relationship than actually being by yourself. It actually gets a lot worse. So getting married to fix yourself is a terrible reason to get married. But even more terrible than that terrible reason number four is number five, which is to fix your relationship. For some reason, many people think that something magical happens when you get married. And let's say you're in a space of a relationship and you're, you know, you're trying to sort things out. You're like, you know what, let's just get married. As soon as we get married, all these problems are going to go away. All the fights and all the toxic cycles of behavior that we have been exhibiting, that my, that my partner has been exhibiting, is going to go away as soon as, as soon as I put a ring on it or as soon as I say yes to him, that all that is going to go away. But this is completely and tragically misguided to think that when you get married, all that is going to go away. Because in a strange way, Marriage has a way of actually amplifying all the facets of your relationship. So however it is, when you get in the space of marriage, it's actually going to multiply, it's going to make it bigger. It's going to even make it more evident. And so if you genuinely respect and value one another, then that means that that respect and value will grow through your married life. It's going to be amplified because like, okay, you know, these guys already respect and value one another. It's going to be amplified. But the same is true for problems in your relationship. If you are bad at communicating now, miscommunication will only get worse in the space of your marriage. If your partner does not respect you, then the disrespect is going to get even worse once you get married. Maybe the person is aloof or they're treating you badly now, that will probably even get worse when you get married. Because basically, when you get married, things will get better if they're already good, but they will only get worse if they are already worse. And I hope that somebody is hearing me because it's important that you understand the, why you are getting married. Do not get married for all the wrong reasons. You need to understand why you are getting married. So getting married to fix your relationship is a terrible reason 
for you to get married. Now, we have talked about five reasons, five, f- five reasons why people get married that are not the right reason. So, the question is, so that if there are some wrong reasons why people get married today, then what are the correct reasons for people to get married? And I'm glad you asked. So, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Now, we're going to be reading reading from verse 27 through to 28, and then we're going to go to chapter 2, and then read from verse 20 to 25. Are you there with me? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. So, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. All right, let's jump to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to read from verse 20 all the way to 25. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Esh! They were naked and they felt no shame. But let's move on from there. In this passage, we see three biblical reasons for marriage. In fact, I'd like to call them the three eyes. Why should you get married? What's the reason why you should get married? The number one reason why you should get married is because of intent. And when I talk about intent, I'm talking about intention or purpose. We get married to fulfill God's purpose. That is God's original intent, why we should get married. The creator of marriage had a clear intent in his mind. He had a picture in his mind when he thought about man getting married. Now, in creating the first human, God had given him a clear God description um, to, to humanity, which was, um, which was to do about exercising God's influence and dominion over the earth. He was asking him to, to, you know, to rule over the world on behalf of God the creator, as you see from that scripture. But then we hear the big but, and, and, and that big but is but, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. You see, the problem with man's aloneness was not, a, it was not a relational aloneness, but rather it was a lack of missional companionship. Not relational aloneness, but missional companionship. There was too great a task to be achieved that he could not accomplish it alone. And so, here's the thing that we often teach at Mabuno. God created everyone here to fulfill a purpose or a task, a God-given purpose, but a God-given task. This purpose was created even before you were created. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. The most important thing that you can do with your life is to discover and pursue God's purpose for creating you. I'm going to say that again. The most important thing that you can do with your life is to discover and pursue God's given purpose for creating you. And so when you get married, you want your spouse to be the destiny helper that will help you achieve God's purpose. I can tell you, when I met, when I met my wife, she found me doing exactly what I'm doing right now, and I found her doing exactly what she's doing right now. She was already in the space where she was fulfilling God's purpose. She was pu- fulfilling a higher calling that was beyond going to the office and, you know, and doing your job and getting a salary at the end of the month and you know, just enjoying life. No, there was a purpose that God had already called her, that had already called me to. And so even right now, this is 12 years later, we are still fulfilling that purpose that God has called you to. 
as much as I'm being, uh, uh, she's, I'm, I'm being a destiny helper to her, she's also being a helpmeet to me, even as we fulfill God's purpose together. Amen. You want to be your wife's destiny helper, the same way she has come to be a helpmeet for you. And so that's why I, always, I, I, I was told this thing very many years ago uh, by, by my pastor who married me all the way in Nigeria. He said, his wife used to say, he said, tell the ladies, I say, don't get married to a man that you cannot look up to. Don't get married to a man that you can't look up to, that you look at him and say, look, I love where, I see where he's going, I love where he's going, and I want to align myself, I want to help him meet that destiny that God is calling him to. And also for the men, look, even as God brings this, this, this help meet into your life, are you also a destiny helper? We talked about that last month. Are you opening doors? Are you setting them up to fulfill, for them to be able to fulfill God's purpose that God is calling them to? Because the worst relationship status is not being single and lonely, but rather married to a spouse who, does not, who only does not understand, but also actively sabotages your purpose. Can you imagine that? They're sabotaging your purpose. Here you are saying you want to do this business, or God is calling you to do this, you want to look after this, and they're constantly sabotaging it. I remember us telling a sister once, because she used to be in the, in the, in the, in the music team, and, you know, and she was very excited and engaged, and then she, she was dating this guy who was so unhappy that she was in the choir. Like, why are you, this worship practice, what, must you go? And there are other people that can sing. Why are you serving God like this? I'm like, ah. I, I told her, I said, that's a complete red flag. This person is trying to sabotage your destiny. He's trying to pull you away from the place of fulfilling your purpose. And so even for the men, you have to be careful. Because, you know, it's, it's so amazing that you find <laughs> some people in church, you know, while they were single, they were pursuing God with everything that they have. Then all of a sudden, they get married and then it stops. They're either too busy or they have a spouse that's not supportive of that vision that God is calling them to. I can tell you that as a married person, there are so many ways that I have to bend over backwards to make sure that my wife is able to fulfill her purpose and her destiny. And in many ways, she has done that for me as well. And so it's a, it's, it's a mutual and a reciprocal relationship of just being able to be help me and to be a destiny helper to one another, even as we pursue this. So let me tell you, it's worse when you're in a place where somebody's actually sabotaging your destiny. You'd rather even remain single than be in a space and a marriage and a relationship here with somebody who's sabotaging that purpose in your life. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? You know, one of the important things that, that we do here uh, for many of the couples that go through um, the Endoa experience, which is one of our marriage experiences here, is that we actually get them in, in, in one of the weeks to actually sit down and write down a vision for their family, for the woman to understand where is this man that I'm loving and following going, but also for the man to understand and say, where am I leading this woman to? What is that purpose that God is leading me, leading me to? What's this space of mission and, and purpose that I'm inviting her to? Because you see, you realize that in, in so many marriages and so many relationships, some of these things are not clear. And so people get into those spaces with some lovey-dovey feeling and we, you know, just daydreaming and they get into that space where they're walking with this person who really has no dream. But also you don't even know the dream that you're following. And so after all the emotions and, 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 you know, and, and, and after all those feelings and the hormones have run over and then you're left looking at one another with no purpose, no vision, no, it's, there's nothing. There's actually nothing to look forward to and you've ended up making the wrong decision even with the person that you want to be with. Because there's something bigger that God is calling us to as a couple to fulfill. And so when we fail to understand that, then you become self-centered and self-absorbed and then your marriage becomes about your happiness. I didn't, and when I say your happiness, I'm not talking about you and your spouse, about you as an individual, your happiness. And that's why people eventually walk away and say, look, I'm not happy. I'm not happy in this marriage. I'm not happy in this space. And so that, that marriage becomes sabotaged and they're not able to continue even in that. And then your spouse then becomes your enemy and then you start fighting one another. Amen. But the second biblical reason why you should get married is for intimacy. And when I talk about intimacy, I'm talking about reflecting God's love, that intimacy. The second reason for marriage has to do with intimacy. Adam exp exclaimed, and I love that, I love that verse. It was, it was the last verse, verse 25. He said, he said now this is, so he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh 
of my flesh. And then we are told that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They were naked and felt no shame. Now, you know that as, 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 as a single person, as you're growing up, as, you, as you're growing up and your body is changing, you don't want to be seen naked. At least that's, that's most people. I, I can't speak for everyone, but that's most people. You, 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 know, you, want, to, you, know, you want the privacy. You want, to, you want to keep yourself covered. You don't want somebody to, to watch you. But this, this space says that when you get into the space of, of being married, that you're able to be naked and not ashamed. You're not covering, you're not, trying, you're, not, you're not trying to hide your body from, from, from your spouse, but you actually give yourself willingly to your spouse. Now, God created marital and sexual love between man and woman. This was entirely God's idea. It was not, don't, don't, be, don't be fooled by, by what the media is saying. It, it, it wasn't Justin Timberlake's idea. It was not Trey Song's idea. It was not Saudi Soul's idea. It was God's idea. Marital and sexual love was God's idea. In fact, the man was not even consulted on this matter because the Bible says that he was put into deep sleep when God was forming this whole idea up. Man was put to sleep. He only woke up and, 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 found, and, and, and found the idea already formed about what it is that God wanted to do. No wonder when he saw the woman, that's why he exclaimed, he was like, wow, this is such a wow. She is beautiful, she is amazing, bone of my bone, flesh, of my flesh. It was an absolute God's idea. And many times because of, of what media has portrayed, we often seem to think that sex is something ungodly and maybe that God is anti-sex. But this is not so. I need to demystify this for people who, who you know, who, who, who are single and you begin, to, you know, some people are not even able to have sex because they, they feel guilty about it. Yes, if you're not within the confines of marriage, absolutely feel guilty about it because you should not be in that space because marriage is, 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 is primarily for within the confines of marriage. But I'm, t I, but I'm telling you, when you're married and you're having sex, let me tell you, you can even play worship music in the background. It is absolutely amazing and it's God sent. I'm telling you, it's, it's a transcendent moment, I can tell you, even when you're in that space. God is the one who wrote the original rom-com. Let me tell you, those rhymes and all those verses, God was the original one. This is no Hollywood rom-com. It's not about what Hollywood is saying. It's not about what Nollywood and Wakaliwood and Kellywood and all these things are saying. No, God is the originator of all this. It's not just about boy meets girl and then sparks fly and then clothes fly and then they're in some room and then they're dreaming into your eyes. No, that's not what it's about. But it's about, he's talking about the intimacy that's even deeper than that. The writer of the New Testament, uh, Testament letter to the Ephesians, quoted a passage today and this is what it says. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound ministry, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Human marriage was given to us as a physical, as a, as a physical as a symbol of, of a relationship between Jesus and the church. So what is this relationship supposed to be like? Paul talked about husbands loving their wives like Christ loved the church, even to the point of dying for her. Husbands, intimacy is not just about sex. It's about dying for your wife. And I need to say that as a husband. You know, it's, it's not easy to, 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 to die for someone or even to die to self and to sacrifice for someone, to be concerned about the other person's needs rather than your own needs. That's, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, I say this, most times just the natural human being is actually about 99.9999% selfish. I'm telling you, even a child does not have to be taught to be selfish. As soon as they come out, they're like, mine, mm -mm, mine, give me. It's always about them. And so that's our natural human nature. It's always about ourselves. But, die, but, but dying for your wife means that you need to put your wife's needs before yours so much that anyone watching is going to say, oh my God, now I understand just how much Christ loves the church. Woo. But in the same passage, Paul also talked about wives submitting to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Wives 
intimacy is not just about romance. It's about you submitting to your husband as a spiritual leader, not just because he is brighter and smarter than you are or cleverer than you are, but because God's intention that everyone watching you will be able to say, oh my God, now I understand what it means to submit to Jesus. Now I understand what it means to submit to Jesus. Because in spite of all the circumstances that you're willing to say, I'm going to submit to this man just as, just as, as, as we need to submit to the church. Now, clearly, this is not the kind of intimacy that Hollywood teaches us in the rom-coms. But it's no surprise that we're making such a mess of it because we have completely twisted this around. So, but the, before I end, the third purpose for marriage is so that there is increase, increase. And when I talk about increase, I'm talking about producing godly offspring. Our passage shows us that humans were created as male and female so that they could be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. They were created as male and female. There are not two men who can procreate and create another human being. There are not two women that can, that can be together and create another human being. This is male and female. God created marriage as a vehicle through which humans would produce, protect, nurture, and raise up the next generation. Again, <laughs> this goes a little bit deeper than obvious. The prophet Malachi talked about why God was angry at the married couples in Israel who were practicing um, infidelity. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. It's not just about producing children because anyone can do that. I mean, people are, are, are having sex and having children and, and, and throwing away children and, and, you know, just disposing of children. Anybody can have children. But it's about producing godly children. Every marriage should create a conducive environment that would bring up godly children. So whether you're able to have biological children or not, because these, even with the instances where you're not able to have children, you're in a space where you're actually able to, have, uh, to adopt children, or even that you have spiritual children that are around you, every marriage is the biggest signpost towards God that your children will ever have. Your marriage. Let me tell you, many of us I know may have been in situations and circumstances where maybe we looked to our parents' marriage and we thought, hmm, Maybe, I don't know, and, and there were so many issues and there were so many dynamics that were, were involved. And I'm not even saying this to even judge our parents because sometimes as children we get the place, especially when we grow older, that you want to judge your parents for decisions they made or for maybe how they may have affected the way you, are, you, 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 you perceive a marriage and relationship and all these things. But it's important right now that in your life that you understand that your marriage is the biggest signpost um, that God has given your children um, concerning um, godliness but also about marriage. And this means that your happiness is not the first priority when it comes to marriage. Because sometimes you're so busy at work, you don't even have time for your kids, you don't even have time for your spouse, you, you claim, oh, you know, I'm working for them, I'm doing this, I'm doing for them, and then you're thinking that the best thing you can do for them is to take them to an expensive school or to buy them expensive gifts and to take them on holidays rather than actually daily and deliberately actually spending time with your children. But are you also so caught up in your happiness that you are walking away from your marriage, hoping that your children are going to be fine in some co-parenting arrangement. You know, you're so concerned about your happiness. You're like, you know what, this, this is not that important enough. You know what, I, I'll love them from afar. You know, their mother will be fine or their father will be fine. You know, you've moved on and you're hoping that in that co-parenting situation that your children will be fine. And I've heard many people say this. And they say, I, uh, uh, they say the only reason our parents stayed in the marriage was because of the children. Though that was clearly not a good marriage, maybe it was even a, a violent marriage or whatever it was, but I can tell you that it was actually a valid reason for them to stay together. Because bringing up children is costly and it's a sacrificial act. 
As a father of three, I can tell you that it's not that easy. Let me tell you, it's, it's sacrifice. You, you have to, to be there for your children, to be able to mentor your children, it's, it's, it's going to cost you something. It's, it, it's not, it doesn't just come as easy as you want it to be. But the objective here is that we are able to raise up fellow gardeners, adults, who are also actively pursuing God's given purpose in our world. My success as a parent will be shown in how my children are perceived. Because I can be, I, it, would be, it would be so tragic if as a pastor, I wake up one day and my kids totally unconcerned about the things of God. I'm not even saying they should become pastors, but that they understand that they're in a space of relationship and they're pursuing their God-given purpose as God will direct them. So as you can see, the world's reasons for getting married are completely different from God's reasons. No wonder we have such drama today even in our marriages in the world and everywhere that you turn that there's so much drama because people are getting married for all the wrong reasons. And this is including Christians. Yes, people come to church, but sometimes the reason why they get married is for all the wrong reasons. People get married because they are feeling cold. The people get married because they want to have sex. There are all these reasons why people get married that has nothing to do with what it is that God has ordained and prepared marriage for. So, but next week, we're going to be talking about an idea that is completely, completely going to re revolutionize our view of marriage. It's going to change our perspective of, of, of why marriage, but what marriage also is like. So, please invite your friends invite your neighbors, invite your frenemies, in fact, invite your ex and his ex and their exes, invite everybody so they can come and be part of this conversation and hear what it is that God is speaking to us so that we're going to, we can avoid all these relationships and, and just uh, prevent ourselves from sabotaging our relationships and our marriage even in this season. So, but I want to pray for us. Maybe you're there and you're single and you're so focused on getting married that you're finding yourself in a space where you're getting married for all the wrong reasons. That's if you're not already fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Marriage is not going to do it for you. And so I want to pray for you this morning that God is going to open your eyes and your heart to receive this message so that even as you go back and listen to this conversation, maybe look back at the notes that you have written, that God is going to open your eyes so that you're going to be able to fulfill and walk in, in purpose and walk in obedience of what it is that God is saying. But I also want to pray for the married people that are here. Perhaps your marriage is already fulfilling God's purpose and we're going to just pray that God will keep you on that track. But maybe you're in the place where, even as a married person, maybe you got married for all the wrong reason and you're in a space where your marriage is suffering, your relationships are suffering, and right now you need God's redemptive power to put you back on track for both you and your spouse as you walk this journey. Maybe when you were getting married, you had no clue what marriage was about, but I want to say today that God is a God of second chances and he's able to redeem you even from that path. And so just, just bow your heads even as we pray today. Father, we want to thank you and bless you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the conversation that we've had. We thank you for the word that has come forth. And Lord, we pray that for those who are in this space where they are seeking a marriage partner, Lord, that this word will be true to them, would shed a light in their lives where there is darkness, that they would be able to make the right decisions concerning why they need to get married. That as they look for that prospective spouse, Lord, that they would understand these things and would be able to make a spirit-led, a godly decision concerning the person that they're going to spend the rest of their lives with, oh God. And even for those that are, are, are not in the space of thinking about marriage, oh Lord, that they would understand these things and will be able to help their friends, their siblings, and their loved ones, oh God, concerning making the right decision, that they shall be a wise counsel, oh God, to those that are around them. I want to pray for every marriage, Lord, in Mavuno Church, and I just pray, Lord, that, that, that for those Lord, that are already on track and got married for the right reason, Lord, that you would establish your purpose even further in their lives in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord, that they would not lose track. We come against every plan of the enemy, O oh God, every seed that has been sown in their marriage that is not of you, that is trying to set them off track, Lord, that it would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. 
And Father, I pray, Lord, that for those who are, are, were completely oblivious, Lord, to why they should get married and got married for all the wrong reasons, Father, I know that you're a God of second chances and that you would make all things work together for them that love you according to your purpose. And so, Lord, I pray that there would be a turning around in that marriage, O oh Lord, for that spouse that has gone wayward, for, 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 for that husband, that wife, O oh Lord, that has begun to do things that have nothing to do, that is not glorifying you, that is not leading them, O oh God, even a place of raising godly offspring and there is no intimacy, O oh God, and there is no reflection of your love. Lord, I pray that that marriage will be redeemed today, Lord, even in the name of Jesus. That your spirit, Lord, will dwell in that house, O oh Lord, and will begin to change things around, O oh God, even as they look unto you, who is the author and the finisher of their faith. And so, Father, we thank you and we bless you for this day. We want to give you all the glory and give you all the honor for this. For we pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' matchless name we pray and we all say amen. Man, thank you for staying with us. Please do join us next week, even as we continue with this conversation. For those of you that are within the Mavuno family, but even for those of you that want to be part of the Mavuno family, please stay tuned on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. We shall be having our family night um, on our global movement channel at Mavuno, uh, at Mavuno Church on YouTube, but also on Facebook as well. And we shall be having our discipleship group meetings immediately afterwards. If you would like to be part of a discipleship group, please reach out to the number on your screen, 0789-950602, and there will be a pastor on the other side to reach out to you and will help you get assimilated into a discipleship group in your area of residence. Thank you so much. God bless you and see you next week, even as we have this conversation. Have a beautiful week. Stay safe and be fearless.